In this video, we're going to see how easy it is to create a really simple keylogger for an Ionic and Angular application. And we're going to see how to inject that keylogger into the application through an XSS vulnerability, which stands for cross-site scripting. And then we're also going to look at how generally Angular protects us automatically against XSS exploits. Uh, but there are also circumstances where Angular doesn't cover us and we need to be really careful about that. So if you aren't familiar with XSS or you've heard of cross-site scripting, but you're not really sure uh, what it's about, the basic idea is that it would allow an attacker to execute arbitrary JavaScript code uh, in your application. Now, in a general sense, we don't often worry too much about the security on our front end. A lot of that happens on the back end and we don't trust the front end with a, a whole lot of responsibility really, but there are still some important security vulnerabilities we need to take care of on the front end. And there are some pretty nefarious things that an attacker could do just by running JavaScript code on the client side code. So we have a couple of examples we're going to look at uh, in this video today. And I also expand on these concepts in a lot more detail in a blog post that I've already published. So if you want a bit more background on XSS and the different types of XSS attacks, I'd recommend reading that blog post and then perhaps coming back to this video. Okay, so let's jump into the code for this and just have a look at a few different examples. So I have a really basic example to start off with. And so what we're doing here is exploiting a string that is going to be added to the inner HTML property of uh, some element on our page. So if we open up the template, you can see I just have this div here, and then I have the inner HTML uh, property set to malicious string. So we're assuming at this point that this malicious string in some way has managed to get into our application. Uh, typically this might be uh, perhaps through a user comment form or some way that the user is able to supply some kind of string to the application. That string could get stored in the database. That would be a stored XSS attack. And then when we try to load this up into our application, it's going to execute that vulnerability. So ideally, we would have already stopped this potential exploit at the backend level. Uh, ideally, it would never have been allowed to be stored in this format in our database in the first place. But if we do have something malicious, we do also want to and mitigate it on the front end as well if we can do that. So what I have is four different malicious examples here. And the first one is just a very basic one. They all use the same basic exploit. What we're trying to do is load an image tag. So the malicious user has supplied an HTML image tag. And since we're using inner HTML to insert this into our application, that is going to allow that HTML potentially to be executed and treated as if it was just HTML that we added to the application ourselves. And so what this will do basically is it will try to load this image and the source for the image is just non-existent image. So I could put anything in there. The point is that we're trying to load an image that won't exist and it's going to trigger an error. And then we have an on error handler attached to this image that will then execute whatever JavaScript we want. So right now the application is set up to be vulnerable to these uh, malicious strings. So let's just run through each of these and have a look at what might happen. So the first one is uh, just a very basic alert. Uh, you can use something like this a lot just to see if an XSS attack is possible. And if we load up this page, you can see we get an alert that says hello there. So if this was something that an attacker did manage to get into our, our application, your users might see this alert popping up. Now, obviously, you know, that's gonna be pretty annoying, but it's not much of a problem to have an alert say, hello, uh, it's not exactly all that malicious. But uh, if an attacker could launch an alert, they could do a lot of other things as well. So let's take a look at the uh, second example now. This time we are triggering window.location. And what that will do in JavaScript is just change the address uh, that the user is currently viewing. So we can redirect a user from wherever they currently are, your application, to wherever we want. So I've got it set to Google. So if I save that and we let the application reload, you can see that we immediately get redirected to Google. 
So you can probably see how this could be uh, used more maliciously. Uh, an attacker could redirect you to whatever site that they want to. So this could be a site intended to immediately attempt to get malware onto the user's computer or, or whatever sort of attack they want to try to use through the browser. But perhaps even more nefariously, they could also use that to redirect the user to a page that looks like your website, uh, but it's not perhaps a login page. You enter your details into that login page and then the attacker gets your credentials. And that would be what is referred to as a phishing attack. So we're getting a bit more malicious now. Let's, uh, let's keep going along here. And now this third example is where we start to get into this keylogger kind of aspect to it. So what this one will do is set up an on key press listener. And then whenever a key press is detected, it's just going to log out the uh, key that was pressed to the console. So let's save that and we'll go back from Google back to our uh, application. So this time we load up the application and nothing appears to be wrong at all. The application just loads, apart from the fact that we do have a broken image there, which is a bit of a tell. So what I'm gonna do is just pull up the dev tools uh, for this page. Now I'm gonna open up the console and I don't have any uh, forms, uh, any kind of inputs uh, on this page right now, but if there were, we'd get the key presses for that. And even just typing anywhere, uh, we don't even need to have an input field active just by typing. All these keys are going to pop up in the log. So this might look a little bit scary, but again, you might be thinking, well, it's not that big of a deal. We just have the user's own keys being logged out to their own console uh, locally. So unless the attacker physically has access to the computer or in some way can see that user's console logs, uh, it's not going to be that much of a security issue. However, we can take this a step further for our last example. And basically what I've done here is just extended this same example where just uh, listening for the on key press and we are recording keys from that. Except this time we are adding them to an array. It's a bit hard to see here because it's all just on one line, but we set up an array there and then we have a set interval function and this is going to trigger every 10 seconds. And so we have our key press listener outside of that that's pushing keys into that keys array. And then every 10 seconds, it's going to join that array up into a, just a single long string of uh, letters that have been pressed or uh, any keys. And then it makes a fetch request to example.com forward slash keylogger. And then it appends keys as a parameter that, uh, to that with the key string, which was a string of all the keys that had been pushed in 10 seconds. So in this example, we would assume that the attacker, this is the attacker's uh, own address here. And every 10 seconds, it's going to make a request, a get request to that attacker's URL. And it's going to append any keys that have been pressed to that URL. So the attacker will basically just get a feed of all the keys that are being pressed in that application. And just to show you this actually working, let me again just refresh that and we'll bring up uh, dev tools again. So this time we're not gonna worry about looking, I uh, actually have a syntax error there. Probably should deal with that first. It's the downside of writing everything out to a single line like that. I'm just gonna expand this out. And this will be a way for us to sort of see this in a little bit more detail as well. So let's just pop these onto separate lines. Looks like I have just that extra bracket just there. If I get rid of that one, that should do it. And again, so just quickly, you can see we have the keys array. We have our listener that's listening for those keys and pushing that into the keys array. And then every 10 seconds, we are joining those up and making a fetch request to the attacker's address. So I'll just pop that fixed version back into our string. And I also just realized we missed another one, that bracket at the end. I must have moved that somehow, but that should be at the end of this function. So let's save that and we'll give that a refresh and hopefully now everything's all good. Go to the console. All right, seems to be that we get the error for the image, which will trigger our uh, on error code here. So what we're gonna do now, instead of just looking at the console, uh, we're gonna take a look at the network tab uh, instead. 
and we're gonna see these requests being launched out to this URL. Now it is important to note, as you can see already without us doing anything, is that this request is failing due to the uh, cause policy. Uh, so basically we're making a cross domain request here. So it's gonna fail by default. We're not gonna worry about this error now. We're just gonna assume that this uh, request is going through successfully. So let's open up that network tab and I will just start typing some keys. You can see here already that the requests are getting sent off with just a blank uh, parameter for keys. There's no values attached to that. Uh, but let's start just doing some typing. And you can see this time as I'm typing, those keys are getting uh, added to this request. So I can open up any of those. And again, this is, uh, this is failing. So this request it wouldn't actually go through, but again, uh, if the cores were configured differently, this request could go through. And you can see down here, we have that query string parameters, keys, and it's set to whatever we were just typing. So uh, you can see how this is a very simple example of how an attacker could uh, inject a key logger into your application. Uh, this is just a very uh, quick example, just saying I wrote you know, 30 seconds or something like that. You could of course have a much more sophisticated key logger uh, that works a bit more nicely for the attacker, you know, make the attacker's life easier. Okay, so we have our examples uh, done. What I'm going to do is just switch back to the original example, just so we can more easily see when it is or isn't occurring. And we're gonna look at how we can defend against this now. And so I wanna talk a bit about why this is even happening in the first place, because Angular does have uh, protection against XSS. It has its own XSS security model and it helps strip out uh, XSS vulnerabilities. So let's look at why this is even working right now. So what will happen in Angular is if we bind any values to the inner HTML property through our template, it will automatically sanitize it for us. So the reason that it, the sanitization isn't happening is because I'm manually grabbing that element and I'm setting it in the ng after view init hook here. And that's why that's getting triggered. If I save this again, now the malicious string is just being set in our template through inner HTML. If I save that, you'll see as this reloads, we don't get that alert popping up, which means this attack isn't being executed and none of these attacks would be executed. And if you look at the dev tools, anytime uh, something is stripped by Angular from your application, it's been sanitized, it's removed potentially some vulnerability. You can see here that it will log out warning, sanitizing HTML strip some content. So this is an indicator for us that something has been stripped out. And obviously something we should look into because even if Angular is stripping it out, uh, you should really consider that more uh, luck or uh, just good fortune in general, because we shouldn't, we shouldn't really be getting to that stage in the first place. Ideally, uh, we don't want to be relying on Angular to do that. It should just be more of a, a fail safe to catch things uh, if we do miss them. So binding to the template is uh, safe in this case, or you know, safe with an asterisk. It's not really safe, but at least you know the attack will fail in this circumstance. Uh, but again, if I uncomment this line, we can see that I'm doing something which looks pretty much the same, right? Here I'm adding to inner HTML in the template and here I'm just doing it in my class for the page. I use the renderer, which is the official Angular way to uh, you know, modify elements once you have a reference to them. We're even using view child to grab a reference to that element. We're doing all the Angular stuff here, we're setting uh, we're saying we want to grab the inner HTML uh, property and we want to set it to our malicious string. Uh, but when we do this, again, as you can see, I'll save that. You can see that that means the XSS attack will now work. So this is definitely something that you should be mindful of because it could easily slip by your radar, especially if you sort of have a general idea of what Angular's uh, automated XSS security is all about. You might think, hey, it's cool. Like if XSS vulnerabilities get into my application, Angular will just take care of it and yeah, we'll all be sweet. Uh, so that's not the case, so keep that in mind. So let's look at how we can set this dynamically if we wanna do it in our class here, but still be safe. So this example we will be safe uh, because we're doing the exact same thing here, except this time we're manually calling 
uh, the DOM sanitizer before we set the value. So if we scroll to the top here, we can see we're importing DOM sanitizer from uh, this Angular platform browser package. And basically this just gives us access to Angular's sanitization. And what we can do is give it the security context. So the thing we're sanitizing, uh, so in this case, we're sanitizing HTML. Uh, you might also be sanitizing a resource URL. Uh, if we just go back here and go dot, we can see uh, all of the different uh, security contexts we can use. So we have URL, script, style, stuff like that. So in this case, we're sanitizing HTML, and then we also supply it with the string we're sanitizing, and that's going to return us a sanitized string, which is uh, which will be safe to use. So if I save this, and we let that refresh, you'll see that that alert doesn't pop up anymore. And again, if I just pull up the dev tools here, if we go into the console, you can see that we have uh, this warning that some uh, content has been stripped. So one more thing I wanna cover before we go is we might also, again, uh, you should generally do things the Angular way. If we wanted to get a reference to that element and uh, modify it, we should use view child and we should use the renderer. But, you know, people don't always do that. Uh, so let's look at the case where we are just manually uh, setting the inner HTML property. And in this case, I'm still just using the view child reference, but it'd be the same basic idea if you use document.getElementById. Uh, again, shouldn't really do that, but if you did and you did this, uh, we would have the same vulnerability occurring. So let's just verify that we get the alert there. But we can also still just use the DOM sanitizer to sanitize that string before we set it on inner HTML. And again, we'll let that refresh and we don't have the alert popping up anymore. So again, I did expand on these concepts a lot more in the blog post, so I'll link that in the description. I definitely recommend giving it a read. Uh, but I just wanted to create this video to demonstrate some of these vulnerabilities uh, to you so you can see them live, see them happening and see exactly how Angular's uh, sanitization does impact it. Uh, I think doing stuff like this is really important. I definitely recommend coding up some of your own examples and just getting a feel for how this works and seeing it uh, for yourself um, so you really know when, uh, when you need to watch out for things and when Angular's going to handle some stuff for you. And one final little warning or disclaimer is that uh, this is just one very specific example of a cross-site scripting attack. This is a very broad category. Uh, you could have different types of uh, stored XSS attacks that you know, use other methods rather than just an image tag. Uh, but there are also other categories of XSS attacks entirely. So uh, just something to keep in mind. Yeah, so I hope you liked this video. If you did, please do feel free to leave a like and subscribe and I will see you on the next video.